Thank you for having me, Maggie and Savvy Ladies. Um, I was asked to speak because, as many of you may be well aware, over the past few months, there has been a great deal of uncertainty surrounding custody issues, custody and child support particularly. Um, clearly, the pandemic, COVID-19, has affected all of us in how we deal with the emotions that we're feeling as a result of isolation, change, working from home, having kids home from school and now camp. Uh, and then additionally, how we are co-parenting with um, our co-parents in trying to adhere to or be flexible with custody schedules. Also, as a result of the economic changes that are going on with our country right now, people are renegotiating or trying to unilaterally change their support provisions. And so many, many people have been writing in to both Savvy Ladies, It's Over Easy, which is an online divorce website with content about this kind of stuff with questions. And so I have been trying to volunteer and do webinars when I can that will be helpful for imparting information to people who are concerned. Um, particularly now that some of our courts are starting to open up, we are seeing all of the cases that were scheduled for the second half of March, all of April, all of May, and thus far in June, getting rescheduled and coming up. Most of the courthouses in the country are dealing first with any kind of custody issues before they'll deal with any financial issues in any matter. And even those, even before this all started, particularly here in Southern California where I live and practice, but also in uh, New York State, in Illinois, in Texas, there are uh, there is just a huge glut already before the pandemic and now it's even worse. So people have been writing in and calling and saying, what do we do? How do we deal with this? What can happen? I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the experiences that I've had both as a practitioner and dealing with people that call in um, to It's Over Easy and simply just being out there and talking to people about their experiences. So one of the things, I mean, I've, as you can imagine, when people who were not already getting along that well to begin with get into a situation where they feel differently about how they parent their children, and many of us do, and how to take precautions to guard against their children and their families getting COVID, um, people have different ways of dealing with how they are working out their custody. So I have a family right now where mom and dad had been divorced, but they had been living together and they have a little boy and they had kind of been working on things together. Even though their divorce was final a while ago, their divorce decree said it had a two, two, three schedule. So it'd be mom two days, dad two days, mom for the weekend, then dad two days, mom two days, dad for the weekend. But they weren't really adhering to that. And then what happened is there started some infighting as a result of not only being on lockdown together, but evidently dad was having uh, some other relationships, which I guess he was fine to do given the fact that they weren't married. Mom got very upset about that. Dad moved out and mom said, you're not seeing our kid. You've been with other people. Da -da. So of course dad goes and takes a test. Mom says, we were never adhering to the 223 schedule. You can't see our kid. It will be too dangerous, so on and so forth. Um, in my opinion, that was not a good decision for mom to make. Once dad took the test, once he had been cleared, clearly maybe he was not as responsible as she would have liked, but now you have to adhere to your court order. And if your court order was something you weren't adhering to before, and that's the only document that you have, that's what you have to do. I have another client who, is a dad, they had a court order for 50-50 custody. And when this happened, mom thought this would be a perfect opportunity to simply say, I'm not really comfortable with you seeing him. You're not wearing a mask, you're not wearing gloves. And every time he would go to the house to pick the kid up, she would not answer the door. So he got a court, he got uh, the sheriff to come out. She wouldn't answer the door for the sheriff either. And again, that was in March and he was hysterical and he couldn't believe that this was happening, whatever. Well, lo and behold, it worked its way through the system, and I guess it must have been last week, Sheriff came to her door with a warrant for her arrest. She now has a criminal proceeding because she did not adhere to court orders. One of the things I want people to understand is there will be days of reckoning with all of this. There will be an opportunity 
to make sure that the court orders are adhered to. Now, again, if you think things need to be modified, you will have to file to do that. You should keep records of things. I also have a situation where mom and dad were sharing custody. Mom wasn't being as careful as dad would have liked. Mom had a significant other. Significant other had kids. Mom's boyfriend was coming back and forth, spending time with kids. And although nobody in the immediate family got sick, at some point, mom's mother, who they would visit on weekends, got COVID. Not positive how she got it, but of course, that was something that she was dealing with as a result of her boyfriend going back and forth, she thought, and admitted that maybe they needed to kind of dial it down a little bit. So these are all things that people have been asking questions about, all different kinds of situations. And another thing to take into consideration is, we started this when we were mostly in the middle of spring break. So you had kids that were not visiting parents across the country, going on vacations with parents that are non-custodial parents. So how do we deal with that? How do we deal with getting into summer now if there's any kind of travel bans outside of the country? What do we do with these kind of custody orders if we actually cannot adhere to them? How do we deal with that? How do we communicate with our co-parent in terms of how to communicate be cooperative and be considerate. So those are three things that are in an article that I wrote for It's Over Easy, co-parent during COVID, and frankly, co-parenting at any time. The three C's we call them is a situation, it's called the impact of COVID-19 on spousal support and co-parenting economics. So something to think about is, if you have a co-parent and you're raising children or a child together, especially now, this is a perfect time to kind of adhere to the three C's. Again, they are cooperation, consideration and communication. You have to really be able to cooperate. And maybe you hadn't been cooperating before because you didn't have to, because you had a schedule and you never really talked to each other that much. Now there has to be a little bit more cooperation. Obviously there has to be consideration. I'm very, very, very concerned about the hygiene and the safety and everything else, but he's not, okay? He needs to be considerate of how I'm feeling because it's going to affect everything that happens as we go back and forth and how our kids are. And then, of course, there's communication, talking about it, writing it out, keeping a record of how you feel. Those three C's are important, probably more now than ever, because we are lacking a fourth C, which is certainty. There's a great deal of uncertainty that's happening right now in our world, all the more reason that the two of you need to come together on the things that are the most important to you, which is the safety of our children. Another thing that I find to be very important and sometimes we don't put first and forefront is our kids' emotional well-being. How do you think it feels for them to be told that they're not going to see their other parent? Or how do you think it feels for them to be going in between two parents' houses when one parent is clearly disregarding some of the health concerns that the other parent has and even that the CDC has talked about? How do you think it feels for our kids to not be socializing in class with their friends, going to the camps they plan, going on the vacations they can? Please, please, please put this at the top of your list for the things that you're thinking about because we are so lucky in this day and age to have like what we have right here at the webinar. Have a place where your kids can talk to the non-custodial parent, particularly if they're far away and they're not seeing them on a regular basis. Set up FaceTime calls, set up Zoom calls, um, it's not a younger child's first, uh, you know, desire to get on a telephone call or a FaceTime call with his or her other parent. They, they like to be there in person. That being said, if you somehow um, are able to set up a calm place and if they're the appropriate age and you get them used to it, they will do it and then they will have that other parent to be able to talk to and communicate with. And that's really, really important. And just like like when you were splitting up or getting divorced, it's important that your child feels that you and his or her other parent get along and are able to communicate effectively because that's their sense of security. That's their sense of things are okay in the world. As uncertain and anxious as we are feeling right now, imagine being a little kid. We have to rise above whatever we're feeling uh, about the situation on the whole and about our ex-significant other and figure out a way to make our kids feel comfortable with this. Um, another thing people have asked about quite a bit, and I know some of you are interested is, and because you're savvy ladies, is um, 
the finances. Uh, again, we may not be working as much as we were before. We may not be working at all. And now we have a significant spouse or, or ex-spouse or co-parent saying, I'm not able to pitch in or pay the support that I've been ordered to pay because I'm not working as much. How do we deal with it? Remember, 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 not only the three C's, but that we are all in this together, okay? Just like when you were married or living together, there was one pot and you all had to kind of live from that one pot you were gonna pay as little money in attorney's fees and accounting fees and court fees as possible. Keep the money for your family and figure out the best way of doing it. The same goes for this situation with support. If you have a support order for spousal and or child support, and your co-parent or ex calls and says, I need a little relief right now, you have two or three options. One of them is to say, screw you. I'm not going to help you out. You have a court order. You have to pay me. And if you don't, you're in contempt. The other is to say, how can we figure out a way to work this out so that we can put this on hold for a little bit, reduce the amount temporarily, and then hopefully when things get back to normal, either you pay me back or we go back to normal. How do you work that part of it out? Ultimately, as I said, with the custody, there will be a day of reckoning. So if on May 15th, he or she said to you, I'm not able to continue paying the support that I've been ordered to pay, please, let's see if we can work this out. And you said, too bad, there's nothing I can do. He or she will file something with the court. And ultimately, even if it's not until September, October, November, or 2021, that will be heard. And a judge will look down and say, wow, you really couldn't give him or her a hand with this, could you? And you may ultimately be penalized like the woman who's had the sheriff come to her house with an arrest warrant last week because she wasn't adhering to court orders. See if you can work it out. Remember, you'll each be paying attorneys at some point or at least court fees to get in there and have this worked out later. Some of the ways that we have seen, as I said, are to say, let's put a hold on your support payments for now. They'll continue to accrue. And when you're able to pay, you will. Another and probably more practical way of doing it is saying, let's reduce the support payments. I'll tighten my belt a little bit and see if I can live on a, a lesser amount for a while. And you do the same. And when things are back to normal, we'll bounce back up. If you're going to do something like that, put it in writing. And again, if you are the payor, spouse, or parent, as happens with many of us, make sure you get it in writing if your support payments are going to be put on hold or reduced. What you don't want is to think that you have a communication and an agreement, and then three or four months later, he or she comes back and says, hey, guess what? I'm terribly sorry, but I never made that agreement with you, and you owe me all this money, and you owe me interest on the money, and you're going to be penalized by the court. Get it in writing. Make sure that you both have agreement about what it is you've discussed, and and figure out the best way of moving forward. Again, if you have children, very, very important that they are not part of this conversation and that they feel comfortable. Again, I know a lot of us are living in close quarters right now, but as we all have managed to do over the past few months, find a private space. Having it in writing is helpful because that way kids aren't reading it and make sure that you're having the conversations that are then reduced to writing and confirmed. Um, one other thing I wanted to discuss is another friend slash client of mine who actually got COVID and what that does. Um, she's fine now, but she was definitely out of commission for about three and a half weeks. So she didn't have custody of her kids during that time period. She absolutely did the right thing, quarantined, took care of herself. I think she spent one or two days in the hospital, but then was home. Um, and thankfully, her ex was incredibly cooperative with her, had, as soon as she felt up to it, the kids FaceTiming and doing Zoom calls with her. Um, and then when it was done, what ended up happening, interestingly, is he said, I need you to take the kids now for three weeks. I had them this entire, they were on a week on week off. I had them this entire time. They're now going to be with you. I need to get some stuff done that I wasn't able to do because this was still when school was in session and he was doing the schooling with them. And by the way, although I know that you needed some support money during that time, because just because the kids aren't with you doesn't mean you don't have to pay your mortgage or your water bill or your car insurance. I need to reduce some of that support. And I hope you understand. And of course she did. And of course, then during the subsequent three weeks, she incurred all of the same expenses that she had, but they talked it through and they made it work. And I can certainly have imagined a situation where her co-parent ex-spouse was not as understanding, was not as cool about it, or tried to use it against her as a result of there being nothing else that she could do as a responsible parent. One more thing that people have asked about is um, parents who used to be in the workplace 
for the majority of their children's out of school time and now we're not. So now we have a parent who's not going into the office. He or she had a certain amount of custody but is available to have additional custody now and wants to take on a little bit more responsibility. Again, you've got the three C's, cooperation, consideration, communication. How do you broach that subject? Hey, I'm around a lot lot more. I'd like to spend more time as opposed to spending every other weekend and one night during the week. Maybe I can take on an extra night. What do you say? Be considerate. Figure out a way to make sure that that would be something that works, particularly now that we're in summer and most of our kids are around a lot. Maybe you'd give it a try. It can be an insecure feeling for somebody to be asking you for more time with their kids than what was ordered, but it might be something that your kids are ready for. Try to be considerate not only of your children but of the other person. Try to communicate what your concerns are, particularly with them going back and forth during this pandemic. And also try to cooperate with how to make it work. Maybe you start with one more night during the week, figure out if that works. This is a really good time for co-parents to figure out if there should be some tweaks to schedules, a better way of communicating. I've spoken before about all of the amazing applications that are available to you if you are a co-parent. You've got um, Co-Parenter, you've got FAIR, there's one called Our Family Wizard, Talking Parents. There's a whole range of what these can do. Some of them are simply portals where parents can speak to each other, and some of them have everything down to calendars and financial sharing. Check them out. We're so lucky to have these at our disposal right now. None of them are very expensive. This might be a good time for it because you can see if it's something that works for your family. Um, we're about 20 minutes in. Maggie, wondering if anybody has any questions that they'd like to ask about anything I've spoken about or an actual situation that they're experiencing currently. Yes, Laura, I did see a question that came in over chat, which is saying my ex's girlfriend started living with him when COVID-19 began. I'm not sure if it's going to be permanent, but I do have a few concerns. Are there things I can do about this situation? Uh, absolutely there are. And again, this is a, I, I know it may sound so cheesy, but the three C's really are helpful in this regard. I mean, I don't know how you came to find out that she's living there. My hope is that he told you, but if it came from one of the kids or you just happened to figure it out, maybe send an email saying, hey, I, I figured out, or hey, thanks for sharing with me that whatever her name is, is living with you. Um, I don't know what your plans are, and of course, I don't know if it's permanent or not. Maybe you don't either. I, I, my ex is actually living with his girlfriend right now, and he said, I, I'm not exactly sure how this happened to me, but it's happening, and he likes it. Um, so I, I would say, you know, and then vo voice what the concerns are. I'm assuming, uh, because I trust your judgment, that she's being as safe and careful as you are with regard to any pandemic. Have you talked to our kids about it? How do they feel about it? How does she get along with them? as a household member as opposed to just somebody who is visiting before? Are there things that we should be talking about together in terms of how to address the kids about it? I'm assuming you've met this woman. Um, if you haven't, certainly like, hey, could I maybe meet her? Could, there, could we do a Zoom chat or something like that? I think the best way around that is, and in a very, look, I don't want your ex to feel attacked. You have a right to know certain things. So say, I'm really happy for you that you're happy and I hope that this works out and give me, give me an opportunity to voice some of the things that I'm interested about so that we can have the best co-parenting relationship going forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thanks. And we had a question come in about online schooling, and I just like to remind everyone you can use the chat for questions or you can email info at savvyladies.org. And this question is saying that I had an issue with my ex not following through with online schooling for our daughter, and I'm worried that we might still have these issues in the fall if there's a second wave and my daughter has to do online schooling again. How can I make sure that my X is on board with online schooling. Ugh, very, very frustrating. So I think again, you would you should probably approach him and say, I didn't want to 
get into it too much while she was still in school, but I do want to discuss the online schooling. I know it's difficult because I did it myself. Um, I'm wondering if there's a way that we can get on the same page with it. If that means speaking with her teacher or one of the school administrators before they go back to school, if it means you and I speaking to each other and getting on the same page. If you're not up for it, I totally get it. Let's figure out a way to switch the schedule so that I can do more of it over here or maybe I don't know what the financial resources are, we can hire somebody to tutor her via Zoom. But if you are up for it, can we please get on the same page and kind of, you know, say, it, it's a total pain in the butt. I don't know how old your daughter is, but I had a fourth grader and I had a ninth grader. And the ninth grader was pretty much on his own. He did his own thing. But the fourth grader getting on every morning, they'd have to get on and then they go back and they do a project and they come back. People's internet was out. Other kids would be talking in the class. It really is difficult to do the online schooling. By the end, we got the hang of it. But I definitely think sending an email, making him not feel like you're criticizing or attacking him, really making him feel as though you guys are in this together and how can we do this and is there anything I can do to help? And again, one of the things I like about emailing as opposed to, you know, these days there's not much face-to-face -face confrontation, but even over the telephone is, it gives first you a chance to read what you've written and figure out how it might sound or feel to someone that's reading it. Two, it gives them a chance to read it and kind of digest. I always tell clients, if you're reading an email or even a text from your ex, read it, put it down for a second before you write back. Think about what the message is and what he or she is trying to say to you and then respond. Because I think the initial email that you would write might make him feel a little bit like, oh, there she is, you know, just dumping all over me again. I don't do it as well as she does and whatever. But if you say, this is really not about me criticizing you. I just want to make sure that we have the best possible outcome for our child, hopefully he'll read it, he'll think about it for a minute and either take you up on one of the offers you make or engage with you about how to do it the best way. Hopefully the school can be helpful as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, another question for you is saying, I have a friend who is divorced and has a teenage daughter, age 17, and we opted to have her stay with the dad during the first part of COVID. But during that time, somehow the daughter decided she didn't want to see mom anymore. Mom thinks dad is brainwashing the daughter. Mom hasn't seen the daughter in months now and doesn't know what to do. Oh, that's terrible. Well, okay. As with any situation, there's probably more to this story that we don't know. 17-year-old girls are difficult with their moms. I'm wondering what her communication with dad is. I think as parents, it's incumbent upon all of us to facilitate a relationship with the other parent. There have, of course, been times when my sons have said, oh, I don't want to go to dad's. I'd rather be here. Or this, I don't want to do this. We're their parents. You, you have to tell them you got to go to dad's. And again, at 17, she's too old to pick up and put in the car. But at the same time, anything dad can be doing to encourage the relationship with mom would be helpful. So the first thing I would do if I were mom is to reach out to dad and say, I'm just so devastated. I can't believe I haven't spoken to her. Can you please help me figure out a way to repair the relationship? And hopefully he will do that. Now, again, there are all kinds of great uh, co-parenting therapists, family therapists, uh, re reunification therapists that actually help parents reunify with their kids when there have been issues. Something probably happened more than just dad brainwashing. And also teenagers can be very fickle. Three weeks from now, she can want nothing to do with her dad, which is why we as parents have to stick together. It is ultimately in very, very few situations good for a child to have no contact with one of their parents. Sometimes if the parent, if the relationship is abusive or there's um, addiction issues or any kind of sexual issues, it may be better for them not to have contact, but it's not good for kids not to have that kind of contact. So even if you're the parent with whom the child is living and communicating and what you're hearing is, I don't wanna to go to dad's or I don't wanna to go to mom's or I don't like dad and I don't like mom. Look, we all know there's like a little glimmer of, <laughs> I'm better, they like me better, whatever it is, fine. Then get past that and realize how important it is for your child to be able to have a working relationship with both of his or her parents and how important that will be for them moving forward. 
Um, Johnny's sending me a link to one of our It's Over Easy blogs. Uh, it's called Co-Parenting with an Asshole or Someone Who Does Things Much Differently Than You. This has been helpful for a lot of our readers. It was helpful for me when I wrote it because I think we get set in our ways of doing something and if we are doing it differently than the other person, whether they are an asshole or they just happen to do it differently, for the benefit of the entire family and our and our kids, figuring out a way to be able to co-parent, again, with the communication, the consideration, and the cooperation is ultimately best for your kids. So you may have to let a few things slide. You may have to pick your battles. But again, with this, with this individual who's, who is not seeing her daughter, I think the best place to appeal would be to dad and say, can you help me figure out a way to get into some kind of therapy with her? I just don't want her turning 18 and I, and I never hear from her again. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, definitely. Okay, um, Laura, there's a question of if you can mention the co-parenting portals that you mentioned, and we will send this out over email in a follow-up email, but if you could just repeat those again for everyone now, please. Absolutely. So there's a great one that I really like using called Co-Parenter. Um, I use that. I don't use every function of it, but it's a really, really good one. It's out of Canada where they are in Alberta completely rehauling their system, but it's totally American-oriented and everything else. Co-Parenter. There's also one called FAIR, F-A-Y-R-E, I think. There is OFW, which is Our Family Wizard, which is really just a portal you go in and I think it's something like $100 a year or something like that, and is the only place, I'm being told it's F-A-Y-R, is fair. Um, Our Family Wizard, Talking Parents, all of these are ones you should check out, and even if you just went online and said, you know, co-parenting apps, you know, best ones, you can read what, what is good about them uh, and figure out what you need. If it's a calendar and you need to be able to share it with yourselves and a child care provider, if it is, um, a way to be able to speak with each other. One of the things I like about Co-Parenter is uh, when clients use it, it has all of the communications between the parents and it has the ability for uh, parents to actually note when the pickups and drop-offs happen. So if you get into a situation later with your co-parent who is always, always, always late picking up, you've got all of those. And again, these aren't supposed to be um, these aren't supposed to be pre-litigation applications, but that's just an extra benefit of them is that you have all of your communications in the same place. So if things don't work out, that's available to you. The hope is that these will help communication. I mean, I don't know how old most of the people are on this call, but as parents of this generation, what we have at our disposal beyond the apps, and by the way, all of these apps are listed in the link that, um, it's over easy is sending which is called the evolution of dissolution many of them are there because we kind of review them and that's another one of the things that we'll link with the savvy ladies chat um, but you can also go online and get them and even the ability to text so much better than yelling into an answering machine like I remember my parents doing or or you know having to send a note in the mail we have the we have at our disposal things that make co-parenting so much easier Let's use them to make our children's back and forth easier as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, we do have one more question for you asking if you have a book or if anyone can follow your writing more, um, counseling approach and communication with a, with a divorcee, if there's uh, some more resources there. Yes, so I have a book that was published in 2013. It's called It Doesn't Have to Be That Way, um, How to Divorce Without, uh, without I forget the whole title, but it's, <laughs> it was a while ago. Um, it Doesn't Have to Be That Way, and it's, it holds up today in 2020. I think it's something that it's available on Amazon. Also, if you log into itsovereasy.com without paying anything, without having to get divorced, um, you can read the articles that I and others have written for our blog. And then finally, we have a Life After Divorce, uh, it's called Next Chapter video that's out. It's a freestanding website, or you can also link to it through It's Over Easy. And it has all kinds of individuals talking about um, things to do post-divorce, getting back into dating, getting your closet and your email inbox organized, getting back into shape, meditation, therapy, 
financial uh, suggestions for cleaning up your credit and also for figuring out a good budget plan. All of these things available at Next Chapters, Life After Divorce. Um, search me and it's all there. Oh, Johnny wants me to tell you, it doesn't have to be that way. How to Divorce Without Destroying Your Family or Bankrupting Yourself by Laura Wasser. It's on Amazon. Um, pretty easy to find. It's over easy. It's, it's at It's Over Easy as our Instagram handle. And um, Laura Wasser Official is my Instagram. And like I said, I do this because I want to make it better. I, I am very interested in the evolution of dissolution and how we can make the process which is not a fun process, which is a heartbreaking process, but which also is a new beginning, uh, better for people and their families as they are going through it, because the statistics show that they are going through it. So how do we figure out a way to make it not as miserable of an experience? And that's why we created It's Over Easy, and that's why I do these webinars. Mm -hmm. Laura, can you just talk a little bit about It's Over Easy and, and how it works for anyone that's interested in, in learning more? Absolutely. So It's Over Easy is an online divorce website. Because I've been practicing family law in um, the, the private sector for so long, it became evident to me that people that don't have a ton of money to pay lawyers by the hour should still have access to the same kind of justice system. And because I spend a lot of time sitting in courtrooms, I see people who come in that are pro pers or self-represented litigants, and they're not really sure what they're doing, and it can be super scary and super frustrating. So we created a website that gives you everything you need to get divorced online. You never even have to leave your house. Most jurisdictions do not require a court appearance, particularly now, so you can really do it 100% online. You go on to It's Over Easy, and we actually have a link that Johnny's putting up that says that is called How Online Divorce Works. But basically what you do is you have, you have to be in agreement with your spouse about doing it this way. It's a mediation platform. So you go on to It's Over Easy, and the great thing about It's Over Easy is you can read all the articles. We have something called the Index, which has, it's a referral directory for other mediators. If you do want to hire somebody, lawyers, therapists, financial advisors, um, people that can help you get back into the dating world, people that can help you with childcare, all of these resources available through the Index and the content that we have on It's Over Easy, including links to all of the podcasts that we do at all's fair, um, all available. It's not until you actually are deciding to go through the divorce process that you would actually pay for it's over easy, and it's $1,500, although right now we are having a COVID special, which is $950, to do everything online. So we help you fill out the forms, we help you figure out a deal, you fill out what the expenses are that you have, your income, what you have, your assets, and what you owe, and we get that all together with you, and then you and your spouse figure out what the best resolution for your divorce is regarding custody, division of your assets, and spousal and child support if, if, it's, if it's regarded in this one, and then you submit it to the court, and it's done. So that's what it's over easy is because I really thought that there needed to be an easier way of people going through this process. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great, and we will be sending out all of the links that Laura mentioned, um, follow-up information. We'll put in an email, so you have that directly in your inbox. So those are all the questions that we have, Laura. So I want to thank you for a really great presentation today, and thanks so much for taking the time to answer our questions and provide us all with a lot of helpful information during these very stressful times. Absolutely. Anything I can do, you guys know where to reach me. Thank you for tuning in and listening. And just remember, this too shall pass. Yes. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. And thanks so much, Laura. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.